I'm going to, uh, we're going to look today, we're doing a series on John, we're talking about uh, people who had uh, formidable encounters with Jesus and kind of the impact that it had on them, and um, today we're going to look at John chapter 9, so if you have a Bible, um, you can pull that out, and um, we're going to be going through almost the whole chapter, so I'm going to break it up and kind of go through it gradually as we go through this, uh, through some thoughts about it, and um what we're going to be talking about is what does it look like to actually share our faith in Christ with other people um, in such a way that it doesn't actually wreck relationships and, and is healthy and beautiful. Um, I really wanted to title the sermon, How to Evangelize Without Being a Jerk, but um, <laughs> um, taking all the bluntness off of me. Uh, anyways, um, I want to start by just sharing my first experience. Uh, and there's Oh, well, let me start with two words. Uh, there's two words that kind of, uh, are, they're biblical words and they're uh, churchy words as well that kind of describe this process of sharing our faith. And um, one is evangelism, which um, the root of it is evangel, which is the word for gospel. And um, it means to bring good news to somebody. So there's bringing newsism, um, which is sharing the good news with people. And then there's witnessing, which um, you might know from court system, getting up on uh, a spot to to be able to share what it is that you've experienced. That's really the biblical foundation for evangelism. And somehow along the way, it got turned into a whole bunch of other stuff. And I kind of want to dig into that as we look at this John chapter 9 and maybe get back to its roots. Um, my first experience of evangelism, I was 18. I wasn't a Christian yet. And um, I had recently graduated from high school and I worked at Children's Hospital in uh, the food service area and so I started really early like 5 a.m. and then I would get off at like 2 in the afternoon and I'd go play pool. And so I'd go play pool at uh, the University of Washington at the Student Union Building because that was the cheapest play to play, place to play pool. It was like five bucks an hour. But I had limited funds and college students had limited funds. And so it wasn't unusual to be playing there and have somebody come up and go, hey, do you want to split the cost of this table and we'll play together? And this guy did this. And um, he was a little better than me, so it was good. I was actually getting better by playing against him. And then he goes, you know what? I have a pool table at my uh, dorm hall that we can play at for free. And uh, what if we went and played there for like an hour and then uh, we'll do a Bible study together and then we'll play another hour? <laughs> free pool Bible study <laughs> so anyways I decided to do this and uh, we went and we played pool for an hour and then um, it was time for the Bible study and three of his friends rolled in and um, we all sat down at the table and one of them handed me his Bible and kind of put me in charge of reading the verses, which I thought was a nice gesture. That would act <laughs> um, and would help me find stuff. And, uh, and then he proceeded to lead me through like about eight scriptures that all basically laid out what the gospel was. It was called Romans Road, I later found out. But it was a bunch of scriptures from Romans. Like, okay, we're all sinners and we're saved by grace and we're saved not by our works. And we kind of went through all this stuff, and then somewhere in there was like the four spiritual laws, too, which kind of made me, uh, kind of in my intellectual head, decide, well, I guess I have to be a Christian because there's no other alternatives out there. Um, and then at the end of all of this, they said, so do you want to be a Christian? And I said, no, not really. <laughs> um, and they kind of were stunned. <laughs> and I took it that we weren't going to play even before that. <laughs> and so I went home. Um, but it became really clear that what I had thought was a friendship that was starting was actually a project. And um, that I was at a sales meeting. That didn't go so well. <laughs> um, and... I really, uh, in retrospect, look at that guy and I'm like, man, he, he was bold, he was courageous, I, I appreciate so much about his heart. I, I'm sure, now looking back, that it came from a really, really good place. Um, but somewhere along the way, this sharing our faith had gotten sideways for him. And um, now that I've had 20 years to reflect on that, as well as um, this chapter in John, which I dearly love, John chapter 9. Um, I think that we can find a better way to share our faith and to, to share our story in such a way that it brings glory to God and actually builds relationships. So um, with that, I want to pray and then we'll dive into this passage. So 
Lord, um, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for working um, in this community. Thanks for the heart of this community. And um, I pray that you would use our stories and use your story and guide us into what it looks like to live as people who can share you with others. So here we go, John chapter 9, verses, we'll do 1 through 7 first. Um, As he went along, he saw a man who was blind from birth, this is Jesus, and his disciples asked him, well, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents have sinned, but this happens so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And then having said this, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with the saliva. He put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. In this word he had sent. And so the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. Um... This passage begins with a difficulty, a guy born blind. And um, the disciples are wondering, why would God do this to this poor boy who was born blind? Why why is this problem in his life? And Jesus says, well, you've got it wrong. It's not sin. It's not God smiting somebody for something. It wasn't his parents who did it, or it wasn't something that he thought while he was in the womb. Or uh, it wasn't that, that... This is in his life so that the glory of God can be revealed. Um, And I think it's a very interesting way to view the struggles that happen in our lives and the challenges that come into our lives so that the glory of God could be revealed. Now, um, I have problems in my life. You all have problems in your life. We might as well not pretend we have it all together. That's one of the beauties of this church is we all recognize that we're just people. So... Um, thanks for not putting me on a pedestal. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, but as I look at the problems in my life, I go, well, some of it's sin related. Yes, I, I say stupid things and do stupid things, and that has a tendency to cause wreckage in my life. Um, other people do stupid things and say stupid things, and that can cause wreckage in my life too. And some stuff just happens. Unexpectedly, who knows why, an earthquake, somebody smashes into you, like who knows why it's not all bad stuff. You might have some bad genes, some personality disorders. I know I do. Um, But why stuff happens isn't the question, and that's the beauty of this part. Jesus says, you know, you're looking at it the wrong way. You're trying to figure out why this has happened, and instead look at it as what could happen as a result of it. And what I have learned about God is that he can use anything in our lives. He is the ultimate recycler. He is a very green God. And when we have garbage and junk and stuff, God has a tendency to want to recycle that and to use that in our lives if we will accept it. And when God um, brings something into our life, when something is in our work, it is a space in which God can work. Last week, John ended his sermon by saying, I want to invite you to take something in your life and, and put it into God's hands and then expect a miracle, see what God will do. Um, God creates new ways for his glory to be revealed out of the stuff that's a mess in our life. Um, Romans 8.28 says, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Um, And that's a promise that God can take anything in your life and use it to his glory. And oftentimes I go, well, that's good news because I do have some mess and it'd be great if God could use it. And I often think about, well, that's God's work of redemption and restoration that he's doing in us. And I'm glad for that because it helps my life. Um, This pushes me to the next step of saying, well, maybe God's doing that not only to help my life and to restore me to fullness, but to help other people. And so I need to take these things that God is working in the midst of to be able to hold them out. Um, And that's what happens with this guy. He's born blind. His eyes get healed uh, through this washing, and um, now he has a story to tell. By the way, he had gone somewhere else to get this healed, so the people who saw Jesus put mud on his eyes, and then the guy leaves, that's the end of, like, what they know. It's not like people all went to live with them with the river, and there was a big parade down there or anything like that. So this guy leaves, and then he comes home seeing. Um, So now he has this story to tell about what God's done, but he has something else, and it's in verses 8 and 9. It says... 
His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him uh, begging asked, Isn't this the same guy who used to sit there and beg? And some claimed that he was, and others said, No, it just looks like him, because he would still be blind. Um, but he said, No, I'm that guy. And that may seem insignificant to you, but um, people knew his story. People knew his challenges. They knew that he was blind. We live in a culture where we, um, it's a very hard thing to share where you're vulnerable and, and where messes in your life and where difficulties have come up. Um, we have a tendency to live in a culture where we try to have a perfect image and look like we have it all together. It's significantly easier. Um, I have a friend of mine who is blind and um, in some ways, everybody who sees him come into a restaurant or anywhere else with him knows that he's going to have certain struggles and he might trip over a table or whatever, and everybody kind of adjusts accordingly. Um, and I was thinking about it, and I'm like, he can't hide that very well. But we all hide it. And um, one of the challenges for us in this text is to live as wide open, authentic people and go, no, I don't have it all together. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a pastor. Uh, I love my wife, but we fight sometimes, and we don't always get along, and that's important for people to know, because that's part of the story of who we are. Yes, we have our struggles, and in other people getting to see that in us, and us being willing to share that, creates an open door for them to see what God is at work with in our lives. This is a long haul sort of picture of sharing your faith. People getting to know your story enough that they know what makes you great, what makes you terrible, and being able to watch God as he works in your life. Um, my story, I uh, became a Christian at 19 and a half. I, before that, um, probably since the age of about 10, I was depressed and angsty and trying to find meaning in life. And, and um eventually decided that I couldn't find any answers, so I might as well just party, and that led me into a whole lot of alcohol and drugs and things. And um, and what really brought me to faith was calling up a friend of mine whose life was going somewhat better than mine. And she said, why don't you come to church? And I showed up at this church, and there was um, a bunch of old people in suits, and I was in sweatpants and an Allison Chains t-shirt. <laughs> and they said, oh, come in. We're so glad you're here. And then they invited me to go out to lunch with them. And over the next few weeks, I got to sit around their table and got to see their lives. And as I kind of reflected on how it is that I came to faith, one of the formidable um, conversations that came up for me was sitting at the pastor's table with another pastor um, who was visiting from out of town. And this guy was sitting at the table and he was, he was talking about how his um, son was struggling with drug addiction and, and how... He didn't know what to do, and he just wanted to pray. And they stopped at the table, and they prayed. And I thought, oh, okay, this is not hypocrisy. This is not a pretend show. These people are real, and their faith means something. <clears throat> and over months, um, these people showed what it meant to have faith in the midst of a real life. And then I read the Gospel of John, and something clicked, and I became a Christian. But... Um, reading the Gospel of John was sort of the cherry on top where it all came together. But the meat of that story of my coming to faith was a bunch of people who opened their lives to me and said, well, we're here and we're real and we believe in Jesus. Um, now, with my story continuing, um, I was so worried that I would slip back into this life of partying and worried that my faith wasn't stable. And so I ditched all those old friends. Um, and I deeply regret that. Because honestly, those were the people who knew me and who knew my story and could see the change. Because everyone else I met afterwards, I immediately went into Bible school. I quickly became somebody doing ministry. And they met me and go, oh, you're a pastor. <laughs> wow. If only you had seen me like five years ago. Because then you can really see this dramatic change that Jesus has brought about in my life. Um, by the way, one of the most fertile places of people coming to faith that I had ever seen was the McDonald's I worked at when I became a Christian. <laughs> because those people knew me too. And they go, wow, something's different. Chris is actually happy and joyful and content. We're in the middle of a lunch rush and nobody's happy and content in McDonald's during the lunch rush. What is wrong with you? Are you on something? 
They said, yes, I'm on the Holy Spirit. You should try it. (laughs) And we had Bible studies after work, and people would want to come, and some people go, well, I don't want to be a Christian, but I'm interested in this Jesus thing because it seems to be working for you. And that was exactly what I'm talking about. Um, But it's an interesting challenge to live open and interested in people enough to share your story with them and for them to share their story with you and for you just to be real. Um, It's a beautiful challenge before us. So what is it that we're actually sharing in the midst of these relationships? Um, Verses 10, we're going to keep going here. Verses 10 through 12. um, How then were your eyes open, they demanded. And he replied, well, this guy named Jesus uh, put some mud on my eyes. And then he told me to go to Siloam and to wash. And so I went and I washed, and then I was able to see. Where is he? And he said, I, I don't know. Um, bring words I don't know, by the way. Good to say often. Uh, it's okay when we are sharing our faith with somebody and go, I, I don't know. But here's what happened. Um, and that whole mud thing, that's weird, but it made sense back then because they would put a salve on their eyes and, and that was a, a way to get treatment. And, but this guy goes, you know, here's what happened to me. And I found that as um, I've tried to share about Jesus with people, um, the times that I've tried to do the sales pitch and the times that I've tried to corner people around theological arguments, even if I win the argument, I've usually lost. <laughs> But the times that I've said, well, here's what knowing Jesus does for me. I have a tendency to be less stressed out and uh, more patient when I wake up and and spend some time with the Lord first. And the reality is I can share that with just about anybody, even if they're not a Christian. And they go, wow, that's weird. Um, But that's okay. Because I'm just being honest. And faith is a big part of my life. And so that's going to come out in our conversations. Um, I stopped keeping track of the conversations. I can't think of the five time, five conversations that I've had that led somebody to Christ anymore because I honestly don't keep track of the conversations. But I know faith comes up, and I know it's honest. And if somebody's interested, they ask more. Um, but they try to try to corner this guy around what he believes, verses 13 through 15. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll just read it. It's actually 13 through... 17. Here we go. They brought to the Pharisees this man born blind, and now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes was the Sabbath, and the Pharisees um, also asked him how he received sight, and he said, well, he put mud on my eyes, and I see. And some of the Pharisees said, well, this man can't be from God, because he's not keeping the Sabbath. And others said, well, how could a sinner do this? And so they were divided. And finally they turned to the blind man and they said, what did you to say about him? Was your eyes open? And the man replied, he's a prophet. And then we're going to skip over to verse 24 because we're going to leave out this guy's parents and that whole thing. <laughs> parents go, oh, just ask him. We don't want to get involved. Uh, we might get in trouble for this. So just keep asking him. And so they summon him again and they say, give glory to God. We know that this man who healed you is a sinner. And the guy says, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And then they asked him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he says, well, I I told you that already. And you didn't listen, but I can tell it to you again. Are you interested in becoming his disciples too? (laughs) Um, See, they're asking him theological questions about Jesus. Is he a sinner? What do you think of this whole healing on the Sabbath bit? And and he goes, well, I don't know. But I know this. This is what's happened in my life. Um, Jesus has done a work, and now I can see. And how did he do? Well, he put some mud on my eyes. Um, Part of my story, and this is me personally, um, is I come from a family where um, marriages break down like really, really old cars. Um, All of my siblings are on like their third spouse and and have had a hard time in relationships and I grew up in a family with uh, a divorce that happened when I was eight years old and um, Christina's family is a bit of a mess on this regard as well and she didn't grow up with a good model of what it means to be married and um, I don't quite understand how it is 
that we've been able to figure out how to do marriage. But I do know that the Lord has done some good work in terms of putting us around other people who could speak into our marriage and um, and giving us something that we're both shooting for, the will of God that um, we can join together in. And, and for whatever reason, God has done some stuff in that area. I know in the area of my finances that the times that I have stopped um, wanting to give to the church or the times that I have started to worry and worry and stress about money and not have enough. There is something bizarre about giving to the Lord that frees me up to live as God intends me to with my mind. These are just parts of my story. Um, and I, and I, I share them because I trust that God's going to do something with those parts of the story. Um, it isn't so much about arguing theology or getting somebody to agree with my set of beliefs. Jesus didn't actually say, go make converts. It's interesting to me. He said, go make disciples who want to follow me. And that happens as we share what Jesus has done. And then people go, oh, well, I'm kind of interested in that. Could you tell me more? And I notice in my conversations that the people who are interested want to hear more. And the people who aren't interested, well, they're friends of mine, and they have to keep hearing about Jesus because Jesus is part of my story, and I have a hard time talking about my life without bringing him up. But it's not like I'm trying to like figure out a way to make every conversation, oh, you went to that movie? Well, I prayed for a parking spot for you. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows it's forced. But if we can be people who are connected to the Lord and then share authentically about this part of our faith and not dance away from it and not try to force it either, I think God can actually use our story. And that's the challenge, is can we trust? This guy has this conclusion about Jesus. He goes, well, I think he's a prophet, but I honestly don't get the impression that he needed to somehow force the Pharisees to agree with him. He goes, well, that's what I conclude, concluded about him. I have this friend of mine who's a Jehovah's Witness, um, super deeply involved in their church, and there's some theological differences between myself and her, and. Um, we have this friendship that has stayed intact, even as we've talked about these things, because they're on the side of the conversation. But the real conversation is that we share our stories with one another, and she's trying to rub off on me, and I'm trying to rub off on her, and we'll see what God does in the end. And that's really where it sits. Um, which kind of brings me to the results. Um, and this is what I'm going to end with. So verses 28 through 34. Um, then they hurled the insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man answered him and said, Well, that's remarkable. You don't have a clue where he came from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, and he listens to a godly man who does as well. And nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. So if this man wasn't from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us on religious matters? And they threw him out. Was his evangelism, was his witnessing a failure? That's a good question. Um... This story has been a powerful one in my life, so I don't think it was. God has used this story powerfully um, over the last 2,000 years to lead people to Christ. Was it a failure for this guy as he went home? Probably. He was like, well, I guess they didn't want to be his disciples, and that's a bummer because I just shared a really good story with him. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that I think we find in this area of sharing our faith is can we trust God with the results? Can we live open? and interested and invested in other people's stories and willing to share our own story and then say, God, do what you want to do. I don't know what part of the process I'm going to be in, but I'm going to trust that you're going to do what you want to do. Um, I'm going to share about a couple more people. And by the way, I share this uh, sermon not from a pulpit and hiding in a pastoral office and not in the real world. I actually share it from... Uh, years ago working in an office as an admin. Um, I have a friend of mine uh, who was one of my bosses and we t ended up talking on an almost daily basis and faith came up uh, I don't know how many times because I don't keep track anymore but um, it would come up and um, she was the daughter of a uh, Pentecostal pastor and rebelled absolutely said 
I don't want any part of that. And um, so I met her, and she was uh, del very deliberate about running uh, in the opposite direction of what a Christian should do. And um, I love her anyway. She's great. She's a great person, um, but definitely not living a Christian life and swore like a sailor, which is interesting. But um, anyways, so I sat down with her this week. I hadn't had breakfast with her in a year. Sat down with her this week just because I hear about her so every now and then I throw off a little Facebook message and go, hey, you're going to be in town and want to have breakfast. And I ended up sitting down at breakfast, and one of the first things she told me is, guess what? I found a really good church for me and my kids. And my first response was not what a pastor should say. It was, what you do with my friend Brandy? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyways, uh, and, and she started telling me the story about how she felt like her kids should be exposed to God because she doesn't feel like it's fair that they're not getting sort of any exposure. And she's ended up really liking what the pastor has to say. And who knows where this will lead? And my first thought was 50 conversations or however many we had about faith and going, wanted to have that be a part of like <clears throat> I didn't get to do the whole you know, becoming a Christian and planning a church thing and, and then I realized like who knows I have no clue what those 50 conversations are a part of her story or not um, but I trusted God to use it I have another friend who um, is so anti-church that uh, when we were trying to find a meeting for our admins to all get together um I said, well, I know a bunch of churches we could probably use. All I have to do is make a phone call, and Harvard Church would let me use their space. And, um, and she said, well, if you have the meeting in a church, I won't be coming. I don't want to set foot in a church. Um, but then when her friend was really, really sick, she called me up and said, you seem to have a weird connection with the guy upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> do you think you could put out a word for my friend? And I said, well, honestly, I think God loves you and your friend just as much as he loves me. Uh, so you all can put up words too, but I will definitely pray for him. And when I went to go pray for him, um, I was moved. It was like uh, Coach Stone sometimes gets up here and gets all choked up. It was one of those. I was choked up. I was almost in tears. And I was praying for this guy that I've never met. Um, and then I got a call about 24 hours later. And she said, you know, he's taking a miraculous turn. He seems to be getting better, and they thought he was going to die. And I said, wow, God must really love you and that guy a lot. And I have no clue what God's going to do with him and her story. She probably still won't set foot in a church. But there's still trusting God with the story. And maybe she'll have a story, and um, she'll be able to share it. And so I kind of have this... Um, I brought an old candelabra for a long, but I think uh, what it means for us is that um, we've encountered this light of the world. We are better than this lighter because Jesus lights us. Um, and um, I don't think our job is actually to light the candles, and I think that's where it's gotten a little messy. Our job is to just stay close, see what happens. And maybe, well, I'm caught. Um, that's what God wants to do with our lives. <laughs> We're lit up. Oh, oh. oh, it almost caught another one on fire. All that <laughs> I think that's part of the plan. God's way of sharing Jesus is not to light the kids on fire. <laughs> no, it, it, it's for us to be a flame. And then, inevitably, as that happens, other people will catch the fire, especially if we're open enough about our stories to say, Hey, here's where I'm at, and I know it is not perfect. Um, so with that, uh, I want to leave you with the challenge. John challenged us to put something in God's hands where we would want to see God work. And my challenge to you is to actually share something with somebody else where you would like to see God work, and to listen intently to somebody else's story and ask them where they might want to see God work. Sound all right? Mm -hmm. All right? Let's pray. God, thanks for being a storyteller. Thanks for being one who has decided that your story can involve us and that we can be a part of your story. And so, God, help us to live connected to you so you can rewrite some of our story and do some recycling in our lives and bring forth what you want to bring forth. And then, Lord, help us to live openly 
to the people around us so that they can see what you are up to. God, make us good listeners and good carers and good lovers of other people so that they can uh, know that they have a place where they can process their questions and their thoughts and their ideas about God with us. We love you. Amen. Amen.